Wednesday Night Rugby on Off The Ball with Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us, everyone in. Ireland play in the Kobe Stadium tomorrow against Russia. Ronan O'Gara on the line. Evening. How are you, Joe? How you doing? Very well. So who said the group stages were going to be boring? <laughs> That's the understatement, isn't it? It sure who is. Who said that Japan wouldn't be a threat? I, wow. Wow is the word. I, I presume you yeah. watched that second half in a semi-state of shock as things unravelled. Yeah, I did actually. Even the first half was... Obviously, Ireland were in control, but just from an early stage in the game, you could see that Japan looked like a completely different team to the team we saw in the first game. And I think just the way they moved the ball was very impressive. So when you kind of get that early on, you're kind of going, hold on a sec. Incredibly impressive was the, um, the capacity to, to keep the ball alive. So like, it's hard to know where to start when you analyse the Irish performance. What we can say in broad terms, first of all, is at the very least there is now an inconsistency about this Irish team which is completely confusing. It's hard to know what's going on from game to game and even sometimes within games at the moment. Yeah, that is a, a very accurate way of describing it. You know, I would think, yeah, you look at Scotland and uh, because Ireland were so clinical and so efficient and so ruthless, it became a non-match for a long time and uh, they managed the game from probably 40 minutes and they just for the first 40, they just actually uh, demolished Scotland. And then uh, seven days later, was it, or six days later, um, it looked like Ireland were chasing Japan around the pitch after probably a really structured, impressive 25 minutes. What do you think happened? Um, I think... Uh, um, I think um, what happened was this uh, army against Japan went to lead and went to play and if you do that against a team like that they will play and uh, you could see how efficient they were clearing out rocks and getting moving the I suppose the point of attack and challenging Ireland in different areas and usually then what happened as you said within a six day period where Ireland were very aggressive defensively I thought they were the opposite against Japan and if you give teams like Japan, time and space, it seems that all of their players would be uh, very, uh, what's the word, very um, aware of or of played in, in super rugby conditions. That's what, that's what it felt like watching an open game. And if you want to play an open game, Japan aren't the opposition to be trying to play an open game against. So uh, from that point of view, I think they massively missed the structure that Johnny Sexton brings to games. Yeah. I, but regardless of Sexton's presence or not, which we'll come to in a second, surely there was enough on the pitch in terms of leadership and experience at some point to say, this game is way too open, this is the wrong team to be open against, let's dial this right back and play structured rugby. It's, it's, kind of, it's, it's staggering really that didn't happen at some point. I don't know, it's staggering. I've seen that myself, I've quite experienced right now there, like that too, Joe. I think that's what happens when you're kind of uh, playing and... Uh, circumstances that you're maybe not used to for nine other months of the year and I'm not making excuses but that's what humidity does to that's what happens when your brain stops working to the point that you need it to work and I think that's the benefit of watching on the coach and looking with a little bit of hindsight but when you're stuck in that moment it's very hard to change that it's the exact same as I think when you don't win collisions at the start of the game and you give the opposition momentum at this level it's very hard to wrestle it back it's the same as body language when uh, you look at people, you know, how fatigued they were, how they're carrying themselves when the whistle goes. A lot of people on, on their haunches, a lot of people down. Mm. Um, you could see that Japan, I think, edged Ireland in those little battles all over the pitch. Joe Schmidt came out yesterday to say that for three, for three of the four offside decisions against Ireland, World Rugby had told them that the wrong decision had been given, so Ireland were punished unfairly there. I mean, that may be so. I don't know, is that a great look to come out two or three days later and be, to be talking about decisions like that? Like, Ireland playing to their potential should beat Japan regardless of how many penalties go against them. Yeah, no, I'd agree with that too. But I think in the small point that Andy Farrell came out today and just said the point Joe was made, trying to make was that their discipline is normally really good and it's an area they take massive pride in and they mm. set world standards in that regard, I think. Uh, it might be an interpreter of sour grapes and I don't think that's the point. But the other side of that argument too is that it's, it's unacceptable holders from assistant referees you know Gar says calling two penalties where, for offside which his bosses have proved were inaccurate so you'd expect a little bit more top level of officiating so mm. 
Uh, I agree with you. I don't think it's Japan were a better rugby team on the day. Ireland at 80 minutes for 30 of that they were better. For the other 50 they were a long way second best. And um, you know I don't think any of us would have been complaining too much if Ireland hadn't secured a bonus point defeat. Yeah, it is amazing really that Ireland didn't manage to score for the entire second half. You know, for starters, with the Irish attack, and you've been a defence coach, not least in France, and I'm sure it's an aspect of the game you're still looking at very closely. It's interesting. I'm just reading, happen to be reading Jamie Heaslip's book at the moment, and Gordon Darcy was writing about something similar today in his um, piece in the Irish Times, and they were both almost reminding me of the days where a Joe Schmidt attacking team, they, you know, you would talk about the animation of the players around the ball, and you would talk about the picture that they were presenting for the opposition defence as being. Uh, very complicated and difficult and tricky for the opposition to work out. It didn't seem across that second half, albeit Japan had a lot of the ball, but when Ireland did have the ball, it, it didn't seem, and it hasn't seemed lately, like the picture that the Irish attack is giving the other team is causing them many problems or confusing them. Now, are you looking at the Irish attack in shape and the animation and all these things? Is it any different to what it was when it was really working and humming for Ireland? I never thought about it like that. It's a good, it's a good question. I, I would agree that they're, um, you know, I mean, of all the teams, I think to manage to deal with our attack, uh, you look at the difference between uh, the Scottish game and the Japanese game, and ja um, the Japanese completely um, made light work of our attack. It was staggering, really, to see that. I suppose the ease with which they defended us and as you said we didn't score for the second half but we didn't look too dangerous on many occasions either to score or too threatening or create an overlap so while you flip it and the way Japan were kind of clearing the points of attack at times they looked like they had six men over at certain stages but they actually uh, deprived themselves maybe by sticking their own teammates uh, with poor passes uh, so that's something obviously that Ireland would need to look at um, does it look different to I think what worked against Scotland was the fact that there was, a, I would say, um, start of a World Cup. I would say there was a massive fear factor. I think uh, there might have been an overreaction maybe to the fact that Ireland, everything was back on track um, after um, the performance against Scotland. How good were Scotland? Uh, I don't think they were they were adequate or good on the day, to be honest with you. And I think um, maybe there was a little bit of... Um, yeah, well, now we're back. We'll, we will show up and our game will work against Japan, but it didn't work against Japan and they didn't have solutions on the pitch. And that's the beauty of sport and the beauty of rugby. You've got that 80 minutes uh, window to fix it. And if not, I think uh, you've got to take it on the chin like I suppose a lot of them have. When was the last time you think the Irish attack looked really good and really caused the team problems? Um... Oh, um... Give me some games. <laughs> <laughs> well, they need some games. The six, on, the six the, nations. So we start. Cup warm ups. We, well, uh, there was nothing happening nothing in those happened, games, yeah. really, in terms yeah. of the. So six nations. You know I mean? We had England first up. We had the Italian game, which in Rome went very badly. You could argue it was a decent performance against France, maybe. But how good were France? And obviously in Cardiff against Wales, it was no good. And then. You know, against Scotland away, Carberry made that great breakthrough. And, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But, but, you know, that's a moment as opposed to a trend and, a, and an attack causing routine problems across an 80 minutes. So, I don't yeah, know. Are we, are we, are we back to November? It? it was the Scottish game. Ireland were sharp and everything they did. Sometimes you can get bogged don't, with patterns. And I think once you start talking about that, I think you've already lost what you're hoping to achieve. Because if you become a pattern-based team, yeah. then the instinct and excitement comes out of you. And maybe there is a little bit of that, that that Joe is so good and the players have so much trust in his ability uh, to deliver uh, pictures that players need at this level to probably see things or to process decision-making in their head. Mm. Sometimes that happens for you if you have a little bit of oomph in your, uh, in your carry. And that's what Ireland had against Scotland. Everything looked very natural against Scotland. But against Japan, after 30 minutes, it felt to me that we just... Um, probably lacked direction and lacked, I think, composure more than anything else. You mentioned Sexton, so he would have been fairly crucial in all this, as you've referenced. We had um, Brian O'Driscoll on at the weekend and he was sort of saying, I, I hope we haven't cut off our nose despite our face with Sexton because some players, 
uh, should be given uh, an exception, I suppose. And uh, they asked Sexton, was he fit for the Japan game? Like a simple question, were you fit to play? And he said, well, I, didn't, I couldn't train fully Monday, Tuesday, so the call was made at that stage that I wouldn't play against Japan. Uh, and look, hindsight is everything. That decision probably hasn't aged uh, brilliantly. And now we're at a point where the feeling is, well, he has to play tomorrow against Russia. He'll probably have to play against Samoa as well. And suddenly you're asking him to play three games in a row, maybe a fourth, who knows? We're probably getting very ambitious there, but three games in a row. And you just wonder his profile, can he do that? Yeah, well, that's, that, that's probably the better question. When his profile, can he do it? But there's no reason he can't be doing it. Look at Kieran Reid, you know, he's playing 80 minutes against South Africa. He's playing 80 minutes against Samoa. He's playing 80 minutes... Of, uh, ever since he's come back with the Crusaders, I think so. That age isn't, I don't think, it not a barrier. I think a lot of these guys they've probably don't have enough minutes of rugby in them. So I think you need to change your mindset about how you're delivering that message to players because um, you mean Ireland are going to need Johnny Sexton to be to be performing at the top of his game, but has he had the right probably conditions to prepare uh, to be at the top of his game? I wouldn't be too sure because the World Cup is a hard place to be starting form and if you have 60 minutes going into it it becomes even more difficult than if you're 34 it becomes more difficult again but I think there are the players and especially a player of Johnny's mental capacity he he can do it but mm. the, the reality is if Johnny was on the pitch against Japan would Japan have won they probably would have won Joe I think there's other 14 players that uh, have a responsibility or another 22 players as well and it's not um, I mean I don't think it ever comes down to you mean the five injuries that happened in the last World Cup against Argentina? The deficit was still over twenty points. Yeah. So there, there, there is more to it than that, I would think. So um, in that regard, is a massive, I would say, again, opportunity for these players because uh, they're being written off again, and they, actually they're the only people that can come up with this, but they can't turn it on their head. Um, mm. But I suppose history goes against them in that regard. What's worrying you the most at the moment when you look at this team? Nothing's worrying me in that regard because I suppose <laughs> uh, from a selfish point of view I'm kind of concerning my energy with what I'm doing uh, okay. but if you were with the benefit of experience um, you, you kind of momentum is huge and Ireland don't have momentum and I think uh, and I think they needed that to probably give themselves a good chance in the quarter final but they've lost it against Japan but no uh, the great thing about it is we'll see who the real leaders are and we'll see what this team is made of. In 2011, Ireland beat Russia by 50 points. It was 62-12. Is this kind of no-win territory in some respects? They beat Russia by 20, 30, 40 points. It doesn't allay very much, does it? Is, everything is geared for a, sem or a quarter final assault. But for that game, Joe, that has to be... Um, the 80 minutes that really matters now so there's kind of a whatever a three week prep for getting yourself right for that for that um, for that big game and you know I don't think they can stutter stutter and expect to win a quarter final so I presume if you're part of that team what you want to be doing is, is, is restoring confidence for this game and going up a level against Samoa and then hopefully just putting it all out there for the quarter final by all accounts, this stadium is incredibly difficult to play in. There were 30 handling errors in the England-USA game. There were 35 in Scotland's game against Samoa. It's sticky. It's, it's akin to actually playing with a wet ball. So that'll probably be a part of how Ireland go about their business, I would presume, tomorrow. Like, what would you class as a good result against Russia? I haven't seen very much of them. I don't know much beyond the fact that everyone says they're fairly rubbish. Um... Yeah, but well, they're one of obviously the weaker competition or teams in the competition. Um, yeah, I think what, what I'd be looking at is, is obviously, uh, I suppose, the body language and performance. Okay. You know, I think the result is, as we all know, a byproduct of what you do. So I think they're going to be needed to get in. Um, obviously, uh, you know, what I mean, they're kind of pillars of performance or what they judge themselves on, and. They want to be making sure that they're. They can't obviously be as secure as they they would be 18 months ago, and confidence can't be as high. But you, I mean, you'd hope that the confidence isn't rattled to the extent that, um, you mean they absolutely stutter out of this competition. That would be desperately disappointing for everyone. Yeah. 
A few players coming under a bit of the microscope. Peter O'Mahony is one of them. What are you seeing from him at the moment? Um, well, he got a, a head knock against Scotland, so he didn't. Uh, he didn't play. Um, he didn't play much when he was on the pitch. He was. Um, I thought he was impressive, like every other Irish player that day. The last day against Japan, um, he um, he had a quiet game. Um, but I think, you know, that kind of ebbs and flows along experienced players when they come in and out of form. But uh, it's important he 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 stands up because I think a lot of his peers will look to him to stand up, and I think uh, he usually is a is a good. Um, What's the word I'm looking for? He usually is a good indicator of where this team is at. Mm. Peter Romani has the chest out and if he's and kind of getting set first and he's leading the line out and if he's, uh, you know, I think a, a, a brace of around the breakdown and winning penalties and quick to his feet, I think that's a good indicator. But we didn't see that against Japan. Yeah. Uh, one of the uh, moments where you felt Saturday wasn't going to go the way Ireland wanted it was the line out on 50 minutes about 10 metres from the Japanese try line and again Rory Best and, and the line out just not working at, at key moments as well like as a coach how much longer can you allow that situation to fester? But sure it was top notch against Scotland Was it? I mean there were two that they got very lucky against Scotland with Okay okay yeah well I didn't analyse it to that extent yeah I just thought what, what, watching from a distance I didn't analyse the line outside yeah, you're right. That's more of an accurate comment from you. I think, um, um, I think um, you. Um, it's another subunit job, but I think it's very easy to pick holes in a, in, a, in a lot of things. But I think sometimes you have to kind of have a look at the global vision or the global view of the game and see what. Um, you know, if if it's a campaign to remove Rory Best, there will be always voices and noises around that. I think because of the fact that he's thirty-seven. That's, yeah, but well, to be fair, I, I don't I don't know what the right answer is. Actually, I, I'm I'm not part of this campaign. I genuinely don't know. I can see it as a tough call at this stage, a big call. But who would you start? I don't know. Yeah. See, so, so my my view on that would be, I would think that, um, you know I mean, ninety-five uh, percent of the of the of the big days for Ireland has been Rory Best at the helm, leading as a captain, leading as a hooker, leading as as one of their as their forwards. Mm. I think my fear, and it might be a negative fear, would be the fact that if you were, I don't think I think Sean Cronin is excellent coming off the bench, and people will say well, he starts every week for Leinster. Yes, he does, but it's up probably another two notches from from club rugby, mm. World Cup rugby is, um, and a nice scandal. Is very good, but he would have nowhere near the experience. And uh, what does that say? He's come in, and I think in the morning of the Italy game, and he's done really well as a late replacement. I think when Rory was sick, um, and I think he has answered the call willingly uh, on a number of occasions. Uh, but you know, I think this discussion was probably had long and, and hard between the Irish management about the, the pros and cons of keeping Rory. Rory best for a rugby World Cup campaign. So yeah. I would say after a defeat, defeat to Japan, uh, I would say it would it would potentially open um, an excuse avenue for 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 the inexperienced players in the team. Mm. Uh, last this one is I... a time when you need to be tight, when you need to back each other, when you need to have trust, when you need to get out there. And actually, the margins are tiny, but actually, why not have have the the drive or the attitude to go at it. This can be turned around, but if you keep telling yourself it can't be, it won't be. So yeah. it depends what attitude you take. Yeah, well, I think they have, a, I mean, all the vibes are good coming from Japan. I suppose we're having a different kind of conversation here. Uh, just no, I agree, one. I agree. And it's just, this isn't a negative conversation. That's I mean, ah, negative enough but now. <laughs> yeah, well, you are. You're grumpy as usual. <laughs> Yeah. I'm, having, I'm having to drag every inch of it out of here. Will you come on? Now you're a serious sports broadcaster now, so, you know. Can I ask you lastly then, has anyone, um, is anyone knocking on the doors to come in? Like if you, you... Everyone. That is the absolute beauty of it from right. all squad's point of view. That's a great question to ask. Because uh, anyone now, in particular? 
now the pecking order is gone. There is no such thing. You know what I mean? I think the one, two probably players, I think there's Conor Murray and Johnny Sexton penciled in to play a quarter final. Rory Best will captain the team. Ty Furlong will play. James Ryan will play. Um, the back row is too competitive. Uh, who, no centres. Keith Earls will play. And I don't know who else will play. Hmm. But that's a good thing, I think. Yeah. Well, we'll end on a cheery note. How about that? <laughs> it's not too cheery, is it? <laughs> well, your voice. <laughs> your voice is... <laughs> Is despondent. No, listen, it's true. Okay, we can do this, Joe. We can do this. We're, listen, we're going all the way. They strong enough. We're going all the way, but um, some people are hoping we might lose to Russia or Samoa. I don't see that happening. Mm. Okay. Well, I guess we'll talk before a quarter final when there is always the chance that Ireland can still put together a big performance. That is that is exactly. em eminently possible. Exactly. But that's possible. the beauty of it, as you yeah. say. You don't know what's coming. That's not good for people's hearts and people's spirits, but. You look what happened. The week is a long time in sport, and they've gone from pretty impressive performance to a uh, a, a no show, basically. Yeah. Well, we'll keep watching. Uh, listen, thanks a million. Cheers, Joe. Good, Good man. Star. Thank you. Ronan Agar on the phone there. Our rugby coverage is with thanks to Vodafone, team of us, everyone in. Now, before we leave the rugby, we did catch up with Owen Sheehan last night. He was out and about in Kobe enjoying the best steak around. And apparently, after we let him go, he went for a spot of karaoke. And then today, he sat down with Rob Penny, former Munster coach. He's just been announced as the Waratahs' new head coach. And we're going to bring you Owen's interview with Rob Penny in just a moment. Wednesday Night Rugby on Off The Ball. With Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us. Everyone in.